Good morning and welcome to our Digitalization of Culture conference. Today we're talking about Kilia Pena. I lay down my pen. Let's see what that means. Harry, you are a moderator. You would like to introduce our guests? Gladly. I am very excited about today because we're talking about art that came from, well, that yeah, came from the Sutu between the 1930s and 40s. And with us today, we're going to have Stephen Sack and Stefan Bessels, who are going to explain the work that they've been doing and the significance thereof, and just some very interesting facts about it. I am also, you know, as we were discussing uh, offline, um, you mentioned that you had gotten into some very interesting discussions uh, concerning the subject matter, and I'm looking forward to eavesdropping on that as well, and I'm, as I'm sure our guests are too. So, Stephen Sack, Stephen Sack, and Stephen Vessels, please uh, just introduce yourselves individually, and then take it away. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you to the Goethe Institute for inviting us to participate in this uh, very interesting program. Um, I, for the purposes of this project that we're presenting, I have been the curator of the project. It's a project that arises out of work we're doing with the Lesotho government on the establishment of a new museum in Lesotho. So both Stephen Vessels and I are part of that team. And what we had proposed was a partnership between the Iziko Museums of South Africa and the new Lesotho National Museum. And out of that partnership, we undertook some research into a very, very important artist by the name of Samuel Makonyane. And that's what we're going to be sharing with you. Oh, thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Stephen Vessels. I, uh, my, my field of uh, research is documenting heritage um, sites and objects. Um, so I was very fortunate to be asked to join this project um, to create some 3D uh, computer models of the, the sculptures that we're going to present. Um, and I'm, I'm very much interested in digitizing culture. Um, uh, my background is uh, recording heritage sites in Africa and a little bit in the Middle East as well and Southeast Asia. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested now to focus on South African sites and heritage and and, and these sculptures are a nice link between arts and, and culture and heritage. So it's a really interesting project for me. Um, so, Stephen, why don't you share the screen? Yeah. Harry, is that okay? Yep, that's fine. Oops, let me just begin at the beginning. Okay, so there you have Samuel Makonyane, a photograph taken in 1933. Um, all of the information that we have for Samuel Makunyani comes from this monograph, which was published in 1951 by a man by the name of Damant, who was his dealer. And it's a 35 page monograph. And that is in and of itself is extraordinary because we believe it's the earliest monograph of uh, a, an artist of Africa ever produced. It certainly is very early in the publication of monographs um, in South Africa. So 1951, this monograph gets published by Damant, and that photograph of Samuel Makonyane is in the monograph. And if you look carefully at the photograph, you can see he's standing in front of a, a typical building in Lesotho uh, with these um, cut stone construction methods. And on his right are a set of five of his figurines. And I'm going to be showing you some close-ups of them. But you can begin to get a sense of the scale. Um, they are very small. And if we go to the next slide, we will see where he was working. This is in Kolabata. This is a small village near to Masiru, where he had his workshop. And 
we're working with the Morija Museum and Archive, and this photograph and this research is being undertaken by somebody by the name of Poseso Inyabela, who is a deputy curator at the Morija Museum and Archive. And he's been going and trying to trace the family uh, and any evidence of uh, Makunyane in that village. If we go to the next slide, you will see that in our research, we've been able to find 123 examples of his work in multiple collections. Uh, they're often in public collections in South Africa and in Lesotho, that's the first on the list. Um, there's a collection at Morija, and then there's a, a collection that will be put into the new Lesotho National Museum when it opens, hopefully next year. And you, you'll see some photographs uh, on the left, a filing cabinet with a set of figurines in Museum Africa, and on the right, um, these are the works from the collection from Iziko. So if you go to the next slide, you will see an example of a very extraordinary work that is a unique work that is in the Morija collection. It's, a, it's about, it illustrates a myth, a story. You can see it's a bird called Tlatlasole, and it's a wonderful story um, about this bird with its extraordinary powers and it captures the children and takes them away. And that piece is probably about tw um, 30 centimeters high. And if you look carefully, you can see on the base is inscribed um, part of the story. It's etched into the piece. If we go to the next slide, we will see um, two examples from the Iziko collection. In fact, this is the William Fur collection of these two women um, with pots, one woman with it on her head, the other carrying the pot. Now, just remember how small these pieces are. They really are um, the size of a cell phone in, in height. They're terribly small and very delicate and very beautifully executed. Now, in our unfolding discussion about this work that Stephen Vessels and I have been doing, we will be talking about how an image is produced by a camera versus how an image is produced through the process of photogrammetry. So what you're looking at here is a photograph with a camera, with a, 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 which is not manipulated after the photograph is taken. So if you go to the next slide, you will see another image um, of the same piece. And you can start to see the wonderful delicacy and grace that uh, Makunyani is able to achieve. He's a master craftsman. He's working in the 1930s with a, a, a pit um, at his studio of clay. He describes two different pits where he's sourcing his clay. He's making these very delicate, very carefully observed figurines, which we are, have started to establish um, are portraits of people living in the village. They, this is how, these are women going about their business in the 1930s. This is how they would have dressed. This is life in the 1930s. And they are then fired in a pit or on the surface with, with wood and sticks. And so you get those smoky burn marks on the surface of the clay. But just look very carefully at you're looking at two different pieces, which are, each one is made uniquely and individually. So look at the treatment of the foot to suggest this moving, walking figure. Um, so he's, and, and look at the profile of that face to see how carefully and accurately he's able to capture these figures. If you go to the next image, this is the collection that we have found in East London. It's a significant collection. These are 30 or more works in a, um, a glass case in the East London Museum. And at the bottom right, there's one of the crocodiles that he made. He started off uh, making animals and then he worked onto figures. So if we go to the next image, you will see more of these. These are the ones 
from the East London Museum. And if you go to the next slide, you will see on the left, uh, the warrior, the famous warrior figure that he produces. The warrior is actually a portrait of his great grandfather, who was a warrior in King Moshweshwesh's army. And on the right, you're looking at the warrior that is in the collection in the National Museum in Bloemfontein. And unfortunately, the piece must have been dropped. And so it is broken. And it also takes us into interesting areas of discussion because when you have an object in an art collection, it is perfectly acceptable to restore it and repair it. Whereas if you've got an object that is housed in a social history or an archeology span or an anthropology collection, it is not typical that you would restore and repair. You would conserve it, but you wouldn't repair it. So these works of Makonyane are currently housed in social history collections primarily. They are not housed in the art collections. And one of the, the issues is about how, what does it mean to move these works from a social history museum uh, into an art museum? And so th that's gonna be part of the ongoing work. If you go to the next image, you will see further illustrations of a warrior figure. And then the catalog, you're looking at a photograph in the catalog of an exhibition called The Neglected Tradition which I curated in 1988. And when I first discovered the work of Makonyane, and then if you go to the next slide, you will see this is an, a photograph of his great grandfather. This is now Makonyane, who was the commanding general, the warrior in Moshweshwesh's army. This illustration appeared in the, um, the Protestant evangelical news um, publication, it was actually the, the Paris Evangelical Society. Um, and they published this photo, this illustration, which was drawn by one of the missionaries by the name of Maida in the 1840s. It's a portrait of Samuel Makunyane's great grandfather, who is the, uh, the warrior. If you just go back a slide, you will see so that representation that that little figure would have been based on and we think that Samuel Makonyane might have even seen that image as reference so if you go to the next slide um, and so he converted to Christianity now this is a work that was recently sold on auction in South Africa three or four years ago uh, the reserve price when it went on to auction was eight to 10,000 and it sold for 22,000 Rand. And that also is interesting about what, it, what happens when you take an item from a social history collection and it enters the art market and, and suddenly it starts to acquire value in, in the private sector. Objects of, of, of archeological culture, you can't really own them. Um, so this is also an interesting set of issues around how this work moves from a social history context into an art museum. We can also see, I've, I've you, you made a note of where there's a breakage in the, uh, on the neck of, of this particular piece. Quite a number of the works are broken. And one of the other interesting things about working with Stephen Vessels on the photogrammetry is that with the photogrammetry, you can reassemble that which is broken. So in terms of research, it becomes a very important tool. So if we move to the next image, you will see this is us packing one of the pieces and preparing to move it from the Kirby Museum at Cape Town University to the Stellenbosch Museum. And then if you go to the next slide, you will see where we have, if you look at that big display case, right in the middle of it is this tiny little figure of the Maropa drummer. And this exhibition is currently on at Stellenbosch University. And the clay pieces that you can see in the gallery 
are works made by students who've been studying this one piece by Makonyane and in order to produce um, their own studies and their own student work. And if we go to the next slide, you will see there is the exhibition, the back view of the Maropa drama. And on the screens, those are the images that have been made through the photogrammetry. And if you go to the next image, you will see um, the single figure that has been, uh, that, that Stephen Vessels will talk to us about and exactly how he's gone about executing that work. Uh, and the next image will show you um, a photograph of the clay figure sitting, not, this is not the photogrammetry, this is a photograph of the figure sitting on its in its display case in the Kirby Museum. And the next image uh, will show you the source material. So Makonyane, in making his figurines, had access to a publication by Kirby. Uh, Percival Kirby was the head of the, of the School of Music in the 1930s at Witz. And he traveled around South Africa researching the indigenous musical instruments of Southern Africa and collecting the instruments. And Makonyane would have seen this photograph uh, because Makonyane was commissioned by Kirby to make a set of figures for him of musicians. And Makonyane had access to this book. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see a, a photograph of the drum that that woman is holding. And this is in the Kirby collection. That is the Maropa drum. And then the next image will show you um, the, the drum in the background and the figure in the foreground in the photograph. We've been able to establish that is the exact drum that Kirby collected. And then finally to um, the exhibition that we then produced for Iziko Museum, which is an online exhibition. So if you go to the Iziko website and you, you simply write in Keli Hapene, I lay down my pen, you will be able to actually see uh, the exhibition. Um, and then finally, um, this image, which enables me to segue to Stephen Vessels, because so once again, on the right, that's a photograph of um, the actual object taken by Liddell Moe, who works at the University of Stellenbosch. And then on the left is the image that has been made through the technique that Stephen will now describe. So Stephen, why don't you pick it up from there? Okay, thanks Stephen. Um, well, I'm first gonna start by um, just having a look at the the online exhibition that we created. So let me just pull that up on the screen quickly. Okay. Um, so as uh, Stephen Sack has mentioned, we created a, an online exhibition of the Mokunyani sculptures because, um, because of COVID essentially, there, there was planned to be a physical exhibition at Iziko, but um, it was decided to move the exhibition to the virtual realm um, to compensate for, for the COVID restrictions. So in order to create the virtual exhibition, um, we decided we wanted to create the 3D models and present them online. So if I go ahead and click here, you will see That's the, the full 3D um, model of, of the sculptures. There were 15 sculptures in total, um, seven from the Kirby collection and eight from Iziko. Um, I can just do it full screen. And I'll just quickly go through a couple of them. That's one of the warriors that Stephen was talking about. Um, and this, this 3D uh, model viewer allows you to engage fully with these models. So, you know, for example, you can zoom in, you can really, you can, you know, manipulate the view from any angle. You can turn the model upside down. You can have a look at it from the bottom. And 
it actually gives you a, a, a more engaging experience than if you actually go to the physical museum, because obviously these models are very delicate um, and you don't want to have people handling them much. So they would typically be behind a glass panel and, um, and so you can't actually you know, move them around like we are, like I'm doing now. I'll just quickly go through the, the exhibition. So we designed the, the, the virtual um, exhibition as being um, the models um, included with the, the narrative of Samuel Makanyani. So there you can see all the single, uh, single figurine. Um, and as you scroll down, you will learn about the, the history of the, of the artist and get a, a feel for what these models are like, what they are representing, etc. Um, 3D models are much more than just photographs. You know, especially when you, in, in, the, in the passive form, you can create these, I'm sorry, I just want to zoom back up to the, the rotation. You know, in the passive form, you can see um, as the model rotates, you can, you can perceive that model a lot more than just with a single photograph. So they are very powerful in, in actually creating a perception of the, the artwork itself. Okay, so once the, the exhibition is completed, it was uploaded to Zico Museum and it is launched, as Stephen Sackett says, online. Um, so now I'm going to just detail the process of photogrammetry of how I created these 3D models. I just need to switch back to the presentation. Uh, okay, so to capture the models as digital replicas involves a process called, called photogrammetry. There are other ways of digitizing uh, physical objects into 3D models um, using handheld laser scanners, structured light scanners, um, or you can even model it up from scratch just based on photographs. But photogrammetry, it really allows a very highly detailed, highly accurate recording to happen. Um, so the process of, of first capturing the data involves placing the objects on a turntable and then with my camera, which you can see in the top right of the screen, the, the turntable um, and the camera speak to each other and the turntable rotates the object by 10 degrees. And the camera captures the photograph. Another 10 degrees, the, the camera captures another photograph. So in this way, um, the full uh, um, view or orientations of the image or of the object is captured. Um, so besides the, the automated turntable, we also need to control the lighting conditions that the image is captured in. Um, so in contrast to more uh, artistic photography, photogrammetry, you actually want to create images or capture images that are extremely evenly lit and also evenly um, uh, uh, sharp or, you know, you want a sharp image from across the whole object, you don't want to have any depth of field at all, because this uh, will mess up with mess the, the photogrammetry process, which I'll describe a bit later. Um, and then additionally, you want to have a, a gray card color scale so that you can capture the actual color correctly of the model. So the automated turntable rotates the object to full 360 degrees, but then you also have to lie the object on its back so that you can photograph the object from underneath as well. So a total of four, um, a total of four uh, 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 rotations, four rotations are, um, are done on the model. And there you can see all those white rectangles are the individual images that the, that the camera has captured. I'll just go back one. So these are some of the close-up photos that the, that the camera has captured. And you can see it's very evenly lit and very evenly um, in focus, well, uh, uniform focus across the image. So once the images are captured, they all need to be aligned together, which is this process you can see here. And then from the aligning, once the images are all aligned together, the software 
is then able to extract the 3D information from the object. So using the overlaps in the photographs, much like your eyes work as a, a stereo pair where you can perceive 3D, the software extracts the 3D information. So here you can see on the left, um, the, the, the geometry of the object is um, created. And it's actually made up of, of a triangles. Um, the raw scan that comes out can be millions of triangles actually, but um, the, the model is then optimized to, to display so much information online um, would take a lot of bandwidth. So the model is optimized to, to have a good uh, compromise between resolution and the amount of data. So you can see there the, all the triangles. Then the next image across is that surface but with lighting uh, projected onto it. We still don't have any color yet, but that's, that's just the surface of the, the physical object. Then the next image along shows the, the color projected onto the object. So it's a two part process. You've got your geometry and then you've got your color. Um, and then once you've got your fully color or what we call a textured 3D model, you're able to manipulate those colors and those views. Um, in, in creative ways, as you can see in the next two images. So here we've got the, the Zico collection um, and they all arranged. These are the 3D models arranged and I've created a rendering from those, those 3D models. So as I said, the, the 3D model itself um, exists as the geometry and the color. Now, when we want to present those models, the next stage is actually creating renderings and animations of those models. So as we have tried to remove any aspects of light, uh, of shadow and uh, uh, you know, artistic presentation from the capture process, in the presentation process, we actually want to add back that, that elements of um, you know, artistic presentation, composition, lighting, um, you know, those sort of things. And this process, once we've now got the 3D models becomes very, we're able to control a lot of elements. You know, here I've, I can, you can see I've loaded um, the, the, the musical figures from the, figure, from the Kirby collection into um, software called Blender. And in Blender, you're able to control the lighting as you wish. That little um, orange circle on the right of the figurines, that's, that's your lighting source. And I'm able to move that lighting source around. And as I move it, those shadows will change um, you know, uh, appropriately. So we have now um, a fully creative process where we can arrange the figurines in whatever uh, you know, configuration that we want. And we can really think about how we want to display the models. For example, you can have them all seated facing each other. You can see there's a big light source in the middle. Or you can change the light source and, and show a nice close-up, more intimate um, you know, composition of the models. And here you can see an even more um, close-up composition. Now, this is somewhat in contrast to a physical exhibition where you are somewhat removed from the the models that, or the, the, the figurines themselves. And you cannot control the lighting as much. Because these figurines are so small, um, a light, a typical light would just light up that, that model all at once. And you can see that in some of the images that um, Stephen Sack was describing earlier. But once they become, once they, they turn digital, um, you really have um, a lot of, of, of room to, compose and think about how you want to light um, your models. And this process you can see here, um, depending on, on how um, sort of familiar you are with the process, there's, there's very subtle things that you can change, which, which kind of change the whole mood or, or you know, um, artistry behind what you're trying to present. So you can see the shadow is much stronger on the left than it is on the right, but it's the same uh, 3D model. Um, so that's, um, that's essentially what the photogrammetry process um, allows us to do. What I want to talk about now is, and I'll just move back to a, 
to this model or this this view here. Um, and this relates back to the discussions that Stephen Sack and I have been having is what what is a, a digital replica say about the original? Is it what value does it have? And how do they how do the, the digital model and the physical model coexist or correspond with each other? And I think this is a, a question that's really um, topical at the moment. You know, as we are, are moving more into more and more into a digital environment or um, life, I suppose, the idea of, of physical objects having a digital life um, is going to be more and more relevant. So my research um, is, is well, sort of my background is all about creating digital replicas of physical things. And I've recently been doing some research into what, what is the, the essential differences between a copy and the original. Now, original objects is obviously the one that's, you know, that, that has the, that is the authentic piece. You know, it's, it's got a certain, what we call an aura about it. And the aura is, is made up of the history of the object, the artist, the, the context, the narratives that, that form around the artist and the piece. There's a whole life and story that is attached to the original art piece um, or, or sculpture. Now, when we create the copy of that piece, we obviously, that aura is not associated with that copy. The copy is just a, um, you know, it's a, it's a way to, um, to for, for many other people to enjoy the, the objects. It's a way to distribute that original piece, but it doesn't have that same aura attached to it. Well, that is essentially what the traditional way of thinking about it has been. Um, but the digital model as well, that, that also doesn't have that same aura, you know, because it's, we can't, we can't, the digital logic doesn't, the digital model doesn't have, it only engages one of our senses, the visual essentially. It doesn't have a, a weight or a texture or a smell or, um, you know, any of these other, the other senses that we use to perceive the, the real or the, the physical object. But, um, but that doesn't mean that the digital, ob digital object cannot possess its own aura. And the, the idea of, of transferring the aura from the original to the digital, I think is an important aspect that we need to, to be grasping with so that when people encounter the digital objects, they can still get us, they, they, they still um, get the full experience or as close to the full experience of, of being, um, you know, presented with the original physical piece. Um, and indeed, as I mentioned earlier, the, the digital object can actually give us more access to the model than the physical, you know, as, as you can move the object around, view it as you wish, um, handle the object, which you can't do with the physical piece. So there are advantages to the digital that the, the physical doesn't have. Now, I believe that the, well, the copies of objects um, also enhance the, the original. You know, the more that an object uh, is in the public eye, that its copies are out there um, being spread about culture, it actually enhances that authenticity of the original. Um, so, so a digital copy, I, I would say, it actually enhances that original copy. Once, once you've seen or experienced that digital thing, the original is, is, is possibly or hopefully more enticing to go and view in, in the real, um, you know, in the, in the real physical exhibits. So there's, there's multiple ways that you can transfer the aura or at least create the own aura for a digital object. Um, one of these being presenting the digital object in its correct context. So as we have shown in the physical exhibition, uh, sorry, at, in the digital exhibition, um, presenting the narratives around the, the objects, around the artists, um, the context with the, the digital models um, means that those digital models now are, are contextualized and people can appreciate them 
as far more as just um, 3D models. Um, then the next stage is the creativity or the, the way that the 3D digital models are presented um, also lends authenticity to those 3D digital models. So if you, um, you know, as I was saying, there's multiple ways that you can manipulate the views or the, the presentation of those 3D digital models that, that are rooted in artist or artistic presentation. So composition, lighting, um, you know, there's a whole range of, of factors that go into presenting that, that model. Uh, Stephen, you have a comment, I think? Okay, so no, I think that's, uh... The argument, you know, this is part of this debate that, that we're having, you know, about what is the role of the digital, can the digital replace the original and what does it do to then subsequent encounters with, with the digital and I think that Stephen has made a very clear argument. What I found was in the project that we did with the university, the fine arts students at the University of Stellenbosch, the sculpture students were being asked to work in clay and use Makunyane as source material, um, as reference to make these little sculptures, which you see in the room. They didn't have reference to the actual sculpture. They had the work that Stephen Vessels had done. They were able to look at the digital. And when, you, when I walked into the room and finally saw the real figure, I realized, if we had asked the students to work from the actual sculpture rather than from the photogrammetry, would their subsequent translation have been different? And I would say yes, that their response to a 2D image, because as suggestive and as powerful as the photogrammetry is, it still is a 2D image. And that even though you can turn it around and look at it on a screen, it still is this 2D image. And so the result of the, the study that was done by the students resulted in a particular treatment in the way in which they worked with the clay and they worked with light and shadow, which I think would have been very different had they worked from the real object. So I would suggest that photogrammetry is a fantastic tool for research. It's an extraordinary tool for research. It's also a fantastic tool for presentation in exhibitions where people can interact both with the actual object and the, the digital renderings. But at the end of the day, I don't think that the digital can ever take place of the original. In fact, all that it does is it creates in us a desire and an urgency to actually go and see the real object. So if you're doing, if you're digitizing a book, you can read a book online and there's very little effect. But if you're digitizing a three-dimensional sculpture, I would argue that to really experience its aura, you have to see the actual object. Stephen, over to you. <laughs> um, I, I would agree. I, my background is, is obviously in uh, digitizing objects. So I... I feel digital objects can come very close to representing the original or, you know, the, the, I suppose the idea is really what are we presenting and I think um, instead of looking at these two things as separate, I think maybe we should start thinking about them as part of the same object, you know, the, the, the lines between reality and virtual reality are blurring. Um, Definitely in the future, there's going to be more and more blurring of these lines. And so the digital objects and the physical objects, they kind of, they're almost sharing the same story. And, you know, in this exhibition that, that you can see here, um, the, the, the photogrammetry was introduced into the physical exhibition. You can see on the wall there, those two screens. Those two screens are actually showing those models rotating. They're not just showing um, a still image like that, they're showing the 3D models rotating. So what you actually have is a digital model is now being reintroduced into a physical exhibition. 
So we have a, you know, it's, we, we've crossed over, the, the divide um, is becoming more and more blurry. And I, I find that quite fascinating and quite interesting. You know, um, museums are adopting more digital approaches to their collections uh, in terms of going on site and having a, an augmented reality um, experience. So on your phone or on a tablet, you're able to um, access more information about the original objects. Um, you can, you know, you can, you can do more things with that digital thing, digital um, experience than with the physical. So, we, you know, um, there's definitely this crossover. I mean, I, I would definitely agree with Stephen about um, the, the original will never, you'll never be able to um, uh, reproduce the, <laughs> you never be able to create a copy that is that is the same as the original or, or possesses the, the same aura. And that can be said for, for physical copies as well. I mean, a lot of um, sculptures or, or artworks are, are copied. I mean, sculptures can be copied with, um, uh, you know, there's various techniques of, of applying rubber and creating, or, or 3D printing, for example. Um, you know, um, so you can re you can reproduce copies of things um, uh, that that's been done. You know, and but those copies always re enhance that original um, piece. The thing that is so absolutely stunning about Makonyani every time I see them is how small they are, they, and yet how present they are as kind of living human beings. They're exquisitely observed and beautifully executed and require great, great skill. Um, as we've discovered in working with the students, we've now been trying to work with clay uh, and trying to emulate Makunyane and discovering just what a remarkable talent um, he has. So if, if you also, you know, just look at, at the other slide as well. He's, so 1930s portraits of actual women in the village. You can see the treatment of the blanket, typically how women would wear the blanket, which was different to the way in which men wore the blanket. And those very, very delicate, beautiful, miniature little pots that, that, that he's made. And then this idea of kiliha pene, I lay down my pen. He uses a scribe to draw the detail. He, he first models the piece and then he'll take a scribe and it's almost like a pen. So it's almost as if he's drawing, he is drawing onto the piece, drawing the pattern and drawing the detail. And then the eyes are very, very delicately painted we're not entirely sure how he does them, but they're very, very lifelike. And then he finishes and he lays down his pen. And maybe at this point, Stephen Bessels and I should lay down our pens and see if there are any comments. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very, very much for that uh, insightful presentation. And I mean, there's there's so much to take away from it. Uh, but before I delve into any questions, I just want to find out from, from both of you where your passion for art uh, and, the, and uh, the exploration of culture and heritage came from. And then we'll take it from there. So if we can start with you, Vessels, where, what made you want to start digitizing um, mm -hmm. artifacts, okay. uh, culture? Oh, well, thanks, Harry. Um, yeah, so I studied um, at the University of Cape Town. I studied geomatics, um, which is essentially mapping the earth, land surveying, GIS, um, uh, remote sensing. Um, it, it's, it's very precise measurements, essentially, what we're doing. And then when I finished studying by my professor at the time, he had started a project called the Zamani Project, which recorded heritage sites in Africa. Um, and we were using cutting edge technology um, called laser scanning. And then uh, photogrammetry hadn't really developed so much at the time, but we were using laser scanners to record cultural heritage sites all over Africa. So in Great Zimbabwe, um, Ethiopia, the Lalibeda churches, um, 
did a bit of work in Egypt as well and Kenya, some um, uh, Swahili settlements. So this this sort of passion in, in cultural heritage um, was was really started when I when I was working at the University of Cape Town for the Zamani project. Um, and yeah, you know, I worked there for for over 10 years and then I I've recently started my PhD where I I don't I, I want to take the records, the 3D models that I I have a background and I know how to create and I want to actually make them very much usable for the public. I want I want to create methods and and ways that people can engage with these models. Um, that's that that really inspires people to to appreciate um, I suppose culture. Yeah. I must, I must say that even though I have not, I mean, I looked at the exhibit, I took a look at the exhibition yesterday and, it, and also listening to your presentation, it definitely has uh, given me a larger appreciation for, for what uh, Samuel was doing in his art. Uh, Zach, what, yeah. what, what got you into the field? What, what, um, what caught your attention and, and how did that fire uh, and burn even more? You know, I studied sculpture uh, in my undergraduate degree in the 1970s at Wits University. Uh, and in fact, I, I graduated with a major in sculpture. Uh, and then I went on to become a, a teacher and academic and I joined government and worked in policy and development for many years. And I've come back recently to making sculpture again and to wanting to, to celebrate what the project for the Lesotho National Museum, realizing that one of the great, great cultural icons of Lesotho is Samuel Makonyane, and he's unknown. It just, it's, it's become my obsession to make sure that everybody in the world gets to meet Samuel Makonyane because he just is so, he's such a special artist. I must admit that even you know coming from somebody who's not necessarily an art fanatic, a great appreciation does come about when information is shared and, and light is shed. For example, a few years ago, I got to hear about uh, Stephen um, Mafangayo, who is Namibian, uh, where the Goethe Institute of Namibia is located, and the amazing artwork that he did. Um, he had a little stint in Cape Town and basically um, it, it was very eye-opening to how advanced art actually was, you know, back in the day. And then looking at uh, uh, Samuel Makanyane, the details that were, you know, that, that were, that the attention to detail on those tiny figurines is really amazing. And I think this is where, um, you, know, uh, you know, kind of a, where your, where your uh, discussion slash debate uh, comes in. The fact that the appreciation of the size and the attention to detail is sometimes lost in translation when looking at a two-dimensional image that you can zoom into. So you kind of lose the proportion. However, when they're put together, it's more of, um, a magnifying glass that you can hold towards the, the actual um, figurine or, or sculpture, if I could call it that, and even get a deeper appreciation uh, into it. I wanted to ask in terms of art dealers and okay, not, not art dealers, but rather um, social, social, you know, uh, social history in terms of housing collections, and you know art museums. Sack, where do you stand? Would you would you like things to be housed in in in, in social history settings, whereby artifacts are allowed to age, and should they fall apart, it's left that way, and so on and so forth. And then, or would you rather art museums, where if something starts to deteriorate, it's restored? and given a, a new life? Or is you it know, a combination of... Yeah. You know, you, you're getting right to the heart of a, a massive international debate at the moment, which is around what is the museum? Is the museum still a valid kind of an institution? And how do we make new museums in Africa? 
in order to reclaim material culture that was, uh, as we know, the taxonomies of that culture was, was, was a European construct as those collections were either stolen or acquired or collected in all kinds of ways from Africa and taken into museums. The, the material, Makunyane's material, most of the pieces are sitting in social history collections in South Africa. You know, is there a duty to return them? And do we return them? What does it mean that they were collected as ethnology rather than as art? You know, there the, are the huge differences in, in, in that whole approach. And so while we're trying to make the new museum in which maybe all of these things, the, the issues to do with the environment of nature, of science, of art, are all in one space, if that's the vision for the new museum. In the meantime, our museums still are. We have an art gallery, we have a science museum, we have a social history museum. And in that kind of taxonomic, taxonomic environment, Makunyane is an artist. And when you read the Damant book, he, is, he, he, he becomes an artist and his relationship with Damant, Damant is his dealer. And so I think that at this point, his work needs to be claimed as art and he needs to be celebrated as one of the great Nine, the sculptors of the 1930s in Africa and in Southern Africa. So that's yeah. what, what my view is. Yeah, no, being the earliest uh, monographed um, African artist is, is quite an achievement in, in and of itself. And the fact that you also pointed out that he had an art dealer with whom he had formed a relationship, that, that kind of gives a sense of, yes, he was preserving culture, and I mean, because you can definitely see it, you know, the sutras and the blankets, you can see it in the hats and the music instruments that they would play. And yet he also earned a livelihood from it uh, by having an art dealer. Very interesting. Um, if I want to, uh, to move on to vessels, you know, as I was looking at what you do, it kind of reminded me of how things, are, I mean, I'm not that old, but uh, back in the day there were postcards you know you've never been to a city there are postcards and then there are snow globes and so on and so forth that give you um ideas of what the place might be like and then we moved into 4d i mean 3d now 4d cinemas and very quickly information technology is evolving at such a rapid rate you know one of the one of the things i was thinking is it would be so amazing if technology were to provide a way to look at an exhibition and on the side you have this sort of pad that adopts the texture of what you're looking at how far are we from such a reality um yeah uh well if we look at you know virtual reality so when you put the goggles on and you transport it to another place i mean I could create a, a, a completely virtual exhibition that's in 3D. So you have a 3D room, you have all your, your sculptures and in VR, you could go with your controllers and pick up the sculptures and move them around in front of your face. And that's a very powerful thing. You're getting really up close to the, the object. But now as you mentioned, what, well, yeah, you know, the, the idea is you're actually only capturing the visual. What about the smell, right. the texture? And right. we're not actually that far, you know, um, there are people that complain that yeah, we're not capturing all these senses, but the technology is there um, for smells to be um, sort of given, you know, as, as well as the visual. Um, and also you get these haptic gloves that give feedback. So when you're touching that, that digital object, um, you're actually getting a, a feedback in your hand on how it feels and how it's, um, you know, getting the, the weight of the object or the gravity, uh, you know, that's, Oh, that's difficult as well, but uh, it's definitely people are working on this, yeah, full time. So, oh, well, it's good to hear, but at the same time, it's burst my bubble because I thought, ha ha, I've got something <laughs> to, to contribute. I've, I haven't heard of that, uh, the pad next to the object and you can feel it. That's a new, that's definitely a novel thought. That, <laughs> ah, wonderful. Maybe I should uh, find me a dealer and get, uh, <laughs> yeah. get put into a monograph or something. 
Um, we're we're almost out of time. There's about three minutes left. And would you are there any closing words that you would like to give um, before we sign off, or do I have time for one more question? Uh, well, I've just got one comment. You know, um, with regards to what Stephen Sack was saying about um, you know African material culture being moved um, to you know foreign universities, you could kind of say the same thing with the digitization process. You know. Who is actually owning those digital records now? Where are they being presented? Um, what licenses do they have? Are, are we giving people access to download these digital models and do what we want with them? There's a big debate about open access to, to this sort of cultural content or you know, preserving the rights and the copyrights and all of that. And that's something we're gonna have to really think about um, yeah, in the future. Yeah, it, it, it is it is actually quite a humdinger. Uh, Sack. Yeah. No, I I think we have to go. It's two minutes to. It's been fabulous discussion. Thank you so much um, for inviting us. And Harry, thanks for your observations and questions. And uh, yeah, we really want to commend the Goethe Institute for this fantastic initiative. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And. Harry. Uh, before I hand back to the Goethe Institute, I personally want to thank both of you for, again, I, I did mention such an enlightening and inspiring uh, presentation. In fact, uh, in one of the comments, yes, that's, that's what it said as well. Thank you very much. It was really inspiring. And the fact that um, it's, it, it, we're looking at different ways of preserving culture, heritage, art, and all sorts of things. It's, it's, um, I, I actually appreciate the work that you're doing. So thank you for taking on these initiatives and doing what you're doing. And I, I hope that we'll get to see more exhibitions that you've collaborated on and uh, jump into the debate once again and see how far that has gone. And with that said, thank you very much. It's been so, uh, fun moderating and I would like to hand back to uh, Dietlif at the Goethe Institute. Yeah, from my side also, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan and Stephen and Harry. Uh, it was really uh, inspiring and I definitely will have a closer look at it. And um, I would...